Oh boy, we're finally here, ladies and gentlemen. The chapter that inspired me to start this very guide. One of the most infamous challenges Conquest has to offer, and my personal favorite Fire Emblem map ever. Yes, ever. The long-awaited Chapter 10 is finally here. This is gonna be good, ladies and gentlemen. Let us begin! Chapter 10 is a defense map. Your units start out in a fortified position and need to defend a specific point consisting of four green tiles to the north. If any enemy unit makes contact with these tiles, you get an instant game over. And trust me, they will dart past your units to get there, if given the chance. You need to hold out for 11 turns, and in case that is slightly confusing, and I know it was for me the first time around, that means you need to reach the start of turn 12. This map may seem deceptively easy to begin with, but trust me, those few final turns are going to test your strategical abilities to the limits. There are some key defensive locations in this map that you would do well to take advantage of. The first obvious choke point is to the south, where you will be assaulted by a lot of axe users and flyers. The second is the bridge to the west, which will also be assaulted frequently by more axe users once they have broken down the wall leading over to it. The bridge to the northeast will come under assault by archers coming in groups of two. Lastly, there is also a breakable wall that will open up another path of attack from the south. If that wasn't enough, on turn 7 a nasty event takes place that opens up even more paths of attack, but we will get more into that soon. In order to help you out with your defenses, you will have access to two ballista and a fire orb. The ballista can be operated by anyone capable of using bows. It launches a volley of arrows that can hit a grand total of 5 units in a cluster. The ballista's might and hit rates are fixed and not influenced by the wielder's stats at all. It cannot physically kill a unit, but will leave enemies at 1 health instead, and is also effective against flyers. Your only bow user at this point is Niles, but you can have access to more if you've reclassed most of the villager girl from the paralogue, or captured a generic enemy archer in a prior chapter using your prison. The northern ballista will be very crucial to this map, as the enemy will actually try to hijack it from you by sending groups of archers across the northeastern bridge. You will need to defend this ballista, or the enemy will start raining down arrows on you from behind, and you do not want that. On the western flank, you will find a Fire Orb. The Fire Orb is basically a magical ballista that targets resistance instead of defense, and needs to be operated by a unit capable of using tomes, such as Nyx. It is slightly more effective than the ballista, since enemies tend to have less resistance compared to defense, but it is in return not effective versus enemy flyers. There are four villages on this map that can be visited to rake in some fat loots. The village close to your starting position to the north will give you a master seal. The village to the northwest will give you 10,000 gold. The village close to the barricade southwest of your starting position gives you a dual club. And lastly, the village to the southeast rewards you with a Draco shield. This chapter will feature three different bosses. All the way down to the south you will find Takumi the Archer. This is the first time you encounter an enemy boss with royal dragon blood. He won't move from his starting position, but his presence will still make this chapter considerably harder for you. If you look very closely, you can see that Takumi is standing on top of a dragon vein. At the end of turn 7, after all enemy units have moved, he will activate this bad boy to dry out the water, turning all water tiles on the map into normal passable ground tiles, essentially allowing the enemy to assault you from all directions. There is a way to counter this event, and that is to send one or more of your units down to defeat Takumi before turn 7. This can certainly be done, but it requires you to take some very nasty risks, and personally, I won't be doing it in this guide, even though I certainly could have. Defeating Takumi rewards you with an elixir and causes him to run away, but it won't end the chapter. Do it if you want to, but it really isn't necessary. In addition to Takumi, this map features two mini-bosses. Guarding the west flank is Hinata the Samurai. Hinata won't charge you, but he will attack any unit that comes within his range, so be careful. He is not all that hard, but he comes equipped with the skill Armored Blow, which makes him take 10 less damage to turn he attacks, so killing him with a counterattack is borderline impossible. There is no real need to kill him, and you get nothing out of it, so don't worry too much about him. He seems to be mainly there to make it harder to reach Takumi. On the east flank of the map, you will find Obro, the Spearfighter. Much like Hinata, Obro won't move unless you enter her attack range. 
She's nothing special, but be careful of her seal strength skill, as she can literally sap 6 points of strength from any unit attacking her. Luckily, you get a unit later on in the chapter that can literally one round her, and therefore not suffer the skill's effects. So it's all good. Before we jump into the chapter, there are a few things I need to tell you about the new and improved AI for Fates. Defending a point sounds easy enough, but beware that if enemies have the ability to dart past you in order to rush for the finishing line, they will do it. Particularly the flyers are hell-bent on reaching their target destination, and will often fly straight past your units in order to get there. This is why I opt to take a more aggressive approach to this chapter, moving my units down south and trying to take out as many enemies as possible during the enemy phase, without overextending of course. Sure, you could stick Effie and your other tanky units in a choke point and try to wait the enemy out, but chances are they will start to pile up outside your gates and eventually either overrun you with dual strikes or start by passing you after turn 7, so in this case I find a strong offense to be a much more effective defense. With all that over with, it is time to jump into the chapter itself. We're in for 11 turns of fun. The first turn is all about spreading out my units to accomplish several objectives. I will use Corin to tackle the initial band of Axe users attacking from the south. The rest of my army spreads out in order to reach the nearby villages and set up defensive positions around the various choke points. You may notice something very strange in that I am actually knocking down the southern wall with my units, and this is completely intentional. I intend to wipe out the approaching group of spare fighters coming in from the southwest on turn 2, because as I said earlier, I believe being aggressive is the best way to tackle this map. By eliminating as many of the attacking enemies as possible early on, I set myself up for an easier late game when the enemies really starts to pile in from all sides. As Felicia knocks down the wall, I prepare for the first enemy phase. With the help of the Ballista Shot from Niles, my Corrin can easily dispatch the initial pack of Axe users. Even if your Corrin cannot double them, they are easily dealt with on the next turn, so don't worry too much about it. Turn 2 is all about securing the area south of the barricade. I want to eliminate all units in the area so I can safely secure the village before the shitstorm begins. Corrin is very useful here, but I will use Aqua to send him back to greet a couple of flyers that have started heading my way. Again, always take care to position your units in such a way to take maximum advantage of dual strikes. Also remember that if you have multiple allies adjacent to you, you can change who lends the dual strike by pressing the R button, but this only works on player face. Silas and Arthur will be a valuable tag team up north. I position Arthur so that he can retaliate on the incoming archer with Silas backing him up. Odin visits the village to rake in an easy 10,000 gold, while Nyx continues to blast the fighters with her fire orb. Finally, I visit the village with Felicia to get the dual club, which is essentially a sword reaver axe. Arthur will make great use of this weapon in the next chapter. You may have noticed me moving Elise away from Corrin earlier, and this is intentional. With her personal skill, Corrin takes too little damage, and thus the Sky Knight will ignore him. By moving her away, the Sky Knight will attack Corrin and die on the Retaliation Strike, which means there's one less of them for me to deal with next turn. At the start of turn 3, you will be joined by three new allies coming from the north. They are Camilla and her two retainers, Berica and Selena. They are going to be essential for this map, so let us have a look at them. Camilla might very well be the best unit you will ever get in Conquests. I mean, just look at her. You just have to freaking admire those incredibly large, round and juicy base stats. I mean, holy fucking shit, a base strength and a speed of 19? And a base defense of 18? This chick really is the entire package. Not only does she have superior stats, but her mobility is also amazing since she is a pre-promoted flyer. She can use both axes and tomes, and she also possesses royal blood, meaning you can use her to pop dragon veins. In addition to all this, Camilla has very respectable growths across the board. If you are one of those players that refuse to use pre-promotes since you view them as bad units, this is a habit that just needs to die quickly if you want to get through conquest with your sanity still intact. Camilla will not only carry you through this chapter, but a large majority of the mid-game as well. Even towards the late game, Camilla's respectable growths will make her keep up with your other units with ease. Camilla's personal skill is called Rose's Thorns, and it is a more offensive variant of Elise's personal skill. It's not bad, but being a flyer, Camilla will mostly be roaming around this map on her own, so it can be difficult to utilize properly. Still, extra damage is always nice. 
Overall, I really cannot find the right words to properly express how amazing of a unit Camilla is. In this particular chapter, she will kill basically any unit she touches, and this will be extremely helpful when the Sky Knight starts rolling in. If it wasn't painfully obvious at this point, you should freaking use Camilla. Berica is a... weird unit. Being a Viver Knight, she certainly has a lot of potential, it's just that she joins alongside the best goddamn flyer in this game, and this just makes her horribly overshadowed by Camilla in every aspect. This doesn't mean Berica is a bad unit at all, just that it can be hard to justify using her when Camilla already joins with base stats high enough to last you throughout the entire game. As a unit, Berka is certainly no joke. A base defense of 14 is nothing to look down on, and she has a ridiculous defense growth of 60%, meaning she will be a flying tank once she gets a few levels under her belt. Her speed can be somewhat problematic though, and her shader resistance will make her easy pickings for enemy mages, and regardless of her high defense, she should of course be kept far away from enemy archers. Berica's personal skill, Opportunist, gives her bonus damage when attacking enemies that are not able to attack back. This is an extremely useful skill for a flyer to have, since it basically makes Berica an archer killer. Overall, it is definitely one of the better personal skills in Conquest, so take advantage of it as much as you can. Despite being greatly overshadowed by Camilla, Berica is still a very serviceable unit, and once you promote her to a Vibrant Lord, she might very well surpass her master stat-wise. If you have room for an extra flyer on your team, there is absolutely no reason not to use them both. And last, but certainly not least, is this gorgeous redhead. Selena is your first mercenary, and she has two main selling points, good speed and good defense. This makes her good at landing double attacks, and makes her durable enough to fight on the front lines, but sadly, Selena has a gaping flaw in that she can sometimes get strength screwed, which can really hamper her usefulness. Selena's personal skill, Fierce Rival, is really situational, and in most cases completely unnecessary. Whenever she is backing up a unit with dual strikes and said unit lands a critical hit, Selena will follow up with a crit of her own. This sounds good on paper, but in most cases, a critical hit plus a regular dual strike will kill most generic enemies anyway, so this skill just ends up being massive overkill most of the time. Despite this, I really like Selena. Speed is one of the most valuable stats in Fire Emblem, and Selena's 60% speed growth will ensure that she doubles most enemies she goes up against. If needed, give her some strength boosting items to supplement her low growth, and she will serve you well. Turn 3 is all about getting Camilla into the center of the fray as quickly as possible, which is where Aqua comes in handy. As I stated earlier, Camilla just about one-shots everything on this map, which makes her amazing at hunting down those pesky Sky Knights. You can easily send her into the thick of the fray, nothing can hurt her save the archers, but they are stuck on the other side of the eastern wall and won't get to her. I can easily leave the entire eastern flank to Camilla and Corin, while the rest of my unit sets up a defensive position in the wests. Effie will be preparing to take on a few spare fighters on the next enemy phase. My idea is to kill them as they come, and I find this to be the best position to do it in. Meanwhile, Arthur and Silas continues to clear away the rest of the archers in the north. If you haven't gotten Arthur a bronze axe, his hit rates can be a little bit shaky against them, so be warned, but all should be good as long as they don't reach the ballista. I place Odin in a perfect position to clear up the incoming fighters in the west that have both been battered down by repeated fireballs from Nyx. You can see how effective I am at clearing up enemies during this enemy phase, as almost every single red unit on the map suicides into one of my units. I cannot emphasize enough how much easier this makes Chapter 10, as opposed to simply turtling in the center and letting the enemies pile up. Don't be afraid to let Camilla get a lot of kills, there will be plenty of opportunities for your other units to get experience later. You can start to see now why I focused so much on holding the area south of the barricade. It is really a good position to be in, as I can easily dispatch the enemies as they come in by placing my units just inside their attack range. This really shaves off the amount of enemies I have to tackle at once during a single enemy phase, and therefore greatly reduces the risk of someone getting killed. This chapter is really all about reducing the density of the enemy forces before they can overrun you. As turn 4 rolls in, enemy reinforcements are starting to increase in numbers. A second group of archers will arrive from the south and once again attempt to go for the northern ballista. But I prepare the tag team of Silas and Arthur to greet them before they can get that far. Once again placing Arthur in range of one of them, wielding a hand axe to get the most value out of the enemy face. 
Even though he is the only one on my team capable of using the Ballista, I prefer Niles to do some work down south with his bow instead for now, as he is capable of one-shotting the Sky Knights coming this way. He will return to Ballista duty soon enough though. Elise's mobility is great on this map, as she needs to be in many places at once. It is extremely important to always keep your frontline units at maximum health, and her personal skill is also great for making them more bulky. I am also sending Corrin to the west now, as the enemies on the eastern flanks have temporarily been dealt with at this point. It is worth noting that I am playing this map extremely aggressive, and that on higher difficulties such as Hard and Lunatic, this probably isn't going to work as well, as the enemies are much tougher. But I still think being aggressive and trying to take out as many enemies as possible before turn 7 is the right way to go. I aggro Hinata during this enemy phase, although it is certainly not necessary to do so. You can see how tough he is thanks to Armored Blow, but he otherwise isn't a very scary miniboss at all. As turn 5 begins, I prepare to take down the final archer with Baraka and Camilla. You don't need to take down any more archers after this, as the next pack that comes in won't reach the Ballista before turn 11, and thus they will never pose a threat. I am now free to use my two flying units to ferry Silas and Arthur elsewhere, where they might be more useful. I send all my units to gang up on Hinata, who's actually proving to be more troublesome than I thought, mainly due to some bad RNG on my part, but eventually he does go down. I also utilize a great tag team of Selena and Niles to take down flyers as they spawn from the south. Selena does great retaliation damage thanks to her counter repost skill, and Niles with his bow can deliver deadly dual strikes thanks to his effective damage. At this point, paired up enemy Sky Knights will start to assault you. They can be considerably tough to deal with, but as long as you kill them before they can fill up their shield gauge, you should be fine. Turn 6 will be the last turn you will enjoy the safety of the water surrounding you, so make good use of it while it lasts. This turn, like the others, is all about trying to take out as many enemies as humanly possible before Takumi activates the dreaded Dragon Vein. If you at this point are flooded by enemies on all sides, you're gonna have a real bad time. I set up a defensive wall spearheaded by Effie in preparation for the three spare fighters headed my way on the next enemy phase, using Corin as a dual strike bot and Elise for her damage reducing personal skills. Effie won't be able to kill the spare fighters, but she will leave them low enough for my other units to take them down later. Using my two flyers, I can bring Arthur and Silas into the middle of the map where they will be a lot more useful. As I said earlier, there will be another pair of archers spawning later that will attempt to rush for the ballista, but they won't reach it in time, so you can completely ignore them. As turn 6 comes to an end, we now move into the end game of chapter 10, and Takumi ain't gonna make it easy for us. Activating the powers of the Dragon Vein, he drains away all the water from the map, leaving it wide open on all sides. The layout of the terrain can really confuse newer players, as it appears that the newly formed land tiles are on a different elevation compared to the rest, but don't be fooled, units can traverse them just as easily as they would traverse other normal tiles. Just make sure you constantly check the enemy range to make sure how far they can actually move. In many situations, you can easily mess up by thinking an enemy unit can't reach you when it actually can, and you will witness this later on when I am forced to use a rescue staff to get one of my units out of such a bind. I visit the final village with Berica to obtain the Draco shield. You can certainly give this to one of your tanky units, such as Effie, Arthur, or even Berica herself, to make this chapter a little easier on yourself if you are struggling at this point. The two points of defense might actually help you a little. You can see that I continue the trend of letting my units be attacked by as many enemies as possible to make the most out of my counterattacks. I cannot stress enough how important it is to be effective during the enemy phase of Fire Emblem. It makes the chapter so much easier. As turn 8 rolls in, I realize that my eastern flank is very vulnerable, and that I'm about to be attacked by a lot of units at once. 
I make the decision to retreat my weaker units further back to lure the flyers closer to the ballista, but I decide to leave Camilla on the front lines as there is literally no chance of them managing to take her down without archer support. The Axe users coming from the west can sometimes be really tricky to deal with, as some of them are paired up, and a lot of them have ranged throwing clubs. The Fire Orb certainly helps, but Nyx is usually very exposed from being killed by a dual strike from the canal, so you need to leave at least some units behind for defense. You can see here how the enemy AI fully utilizes its movement to get as close to the green line as possible while still attacking. It knows that placing its units closer to the finishing line will increase its chances of success, and that is what makes this map so incredibly scary. As turn 9 begins, it is once again time to utilize the Ballista to its fullest effect. A lot of the enemy units have rudely darted past me in an attempt to rush for the green finishing line, and it is time to make them pay for it. Remember how in the last episode I called Aqua singing game breaking? This is why. Sometimes certain units are a lot more valuable than others, like Niles here with his ballista. Aqua can allow him to fire it twice in one turn. Now that is utility at its finest. In case you didn't get this already, dancers are OP as fuck. With the enemies weakened by the ballista, it is easy for me to mop up the remaining foes on the eastern flank, and it is important that all of them go down, because they will attempt to rush closer to the green line, and one misstep can still fuck up the chapter for you, so don't get too comfortable. I make my first grave error on this map by placing Nyx in range of an enemy ninja that will double and one round kill her. Realizing this a little too late, I have to utilize Elise and her rescue staff to get Nyx out of trouble. Don't be afraid to use the staff to save yourself a reset, that's why they are there. At this point, things are starting to calm down. I've dealt with so many enemies that their push is weakening, although I almost fucked up by barely noticing the paired up archers on the eastern bridge. Luckily I did see them just in time and moved my flyers away. Crisis averted. The last few turns are actually pretty chill, though this is usually not the case for everyone, and certainly not on higher difficulties. There really isn't much else to say about this map at this point, so I will just let the rest of the chapter play out in the background. And that's it everyone, the infamous chapter 10 cleared in 11 turns. A lot of work went into the making of this particular episode, so if you guys found it helpful and or entertaining, please give it a like and a comment, it really helps out the channel a lot. Join us next time as we attempt to dance the stairs away in chapter 11. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.